First, uh, yeah, Justin, Chief Design Officer at Policy Genius. Uh, yep, yeah, Francois, Head of Product and also the co-founder. All right, so I'll give you a little quick introduction to who Policy Genius is and what we do. Uh, we have a very simple mission. It's to help people get the financial protection they need and have them feel good about it. Um, a couple stats that are out there that you guys might have heard of. Uh, I think it's up to 50% of people in the US have uh, less than $500 in their uh, savings account um, to actually cover a certain loss or something that would happen to them. Uh, it's a huge problem. Uh, and so we've focused on helping people solve that. Uh, and that really starts with insurance. It's the basis of any good financial plan. Uh, a lot of people start, and there's a lot of startups obviously on the investment side uh, and paying down debt. All those things are important, but any good financial advisor will start off with a conversation around insurance and, and protecting the assets you have. And so that's where we've started on that. Uh, we've been around for about five years. We've helped over 3 million shoppers. Uh, we've placed nearly $200 billion uh, in coverage in place. And the number that we're most proud of is our NPS score of 81. The average in this industry is around 30. Uh, and so and anyone who's had a, uh, an insurance experience will probably uh, realize that. And so this is something we put a lot of attention to. And it comes and starts with the products and the interactions that you have with our products in understanding this complex. And it goes all the way down through the process of buying and dealing with the, uh, the humans that we have on the other ends of our product. Uh, so admittedly a low bar, 30 is pretty low, uh, but uh, the two ways that we get these numbers to where they are and that we keep that NPS that high uh, are these guys. Uh, so first of all, these guys, three of which we've got here in-house, please say hi to them after. Uh, uh, the two dogs making out in the front are key contributors to those numbers. Uh, and spoiler alert, the other way that we get to those numbers is staying design driven. So there's obviously a lot written about what a design-driven company is, and just to kind of recap on a couple areas that are important to that. The next one. <laughs> uh, what makes a company design-driven? So obviously focusing on user empathy, uh, culture of testing and iteration, uh, cross-functional collaboration, uh, and very much an emphasis on moving quickly. So you guys are probably more familiar with this stuff than most people. Uh, so we got there. But how do we stay there, right? It's a little bit like SEO. It takes constant proving. You need pruning. You need to make sure the team's focused on the right stuff. So here's three ways that we try to stay design driven. Uh, one is empowering our team leads. Uh, so you can think kind of Zelda Triforce. There could have been a Smash Brothers reference in here, but uh, I didn't have the time. Uh, so design, product, and engineering, you know, we talk about that a lot in this space, right? But what it really means uh, for us is, these guys are sharing the discovery, they're sharing and figuring out what the users need, what their pain points are, what they want, and they're sharing in the decision making, right? It's not necessarily the product manager going off and, and making that decision. These guys, here we've got three examples, Sam, Natalie, and Adam, uh, they're actually operating as one unit. Uh, so they are in all of the customer interview sessions, they're synthesizing together, they're coming up with what's next on the roadmap and what to prioritize. Uh, also kind of quad force, but I didn't want to ruin the analogy because product marketing is a huge piece uh, uh, and we have a pretty strong product marketing function at Policy Genius. All right, so we have a big, big emphasis on savagely prioritizing discovery. I think this is a lesson we've had over the last couple of years and how important that is in the design process and making sure that you're building products that actually matter. Uh, this is kind of dual track agile. A lot of you have probably seen this before. Um, you know, you start off with the discovery, making sure that you're focused on the user problems and solving up the problems up front before you get down to delivery. Engineering time is very, very expensive. And so the more that you can actually spend time up in discovery solving the problems for the consumers then, the better off your results are and the more chances you, are, you have of moving quickly and having actual impact. Uh, and so we put a big value and, uh, and, and uh, emphasis on that. So what does that actually mean? So a lot of de-risking upfront. The most important one of those four uh, bullet points up there is on the value side. Too many uh, teams quickly focus on, let's get into usability testing, right? Like, because that's easy to, to, to actually test. Um, as well as feasibility from an engineering perspective. Oh, we know how to build this. The hardest thing to actually figure out is the value piece. Does the ca customer actually care about this? Is this actually solving the customer problem? And so we spend a huge amount of our time talking to customers up front, actually identifying it's, if it's a problem they actually have, uh, and, and then putting the work behind that to solve the other problems on that side. Uh, also, if you guys are familiar with Marty Kagan and his book, Inspired, uh, those four things you'll see in that book a lot. We had the pleasure to get to work with him for a few days uh, a couple months ago. Really solid read. Um, yep, third piece, valuing the right metrics. 
seems like a no-brainer, right? But uh, what does it mean for us? So problem solved versus feature shipped. That might seem obvious, but if you can remember that like all of the value that you're going to get out of a particular test, the actual success is going to happen on the second or third or fourth iteration. It isn't just about shipping that thing. And sometimes when you have your heads down in the weeds and you're, you're focusing on building the assets, delivering on the knowledge that you got from the test and iterating, you can lose sight a little bit. Or am, am I still really solving the key problem? Speed to testable idea. This is huge, especially on the design team. Uh, the design team with product owns the discovery track as Fran outlined. Uh, so it really is, what is the hypothesis and how quickly can we either uh, throw it in the trash <laughs> or iterate on it, right? Uh, so speed to testable idea, really important for us. Uh, uh, and I don't know what kind of animal that is. Does anybody know? Aardvark? It's some, I don't know. I think I saw it in a petting zoo in upstate New York before it collapsed. Uh, anyway, strength of synthesis, synthesis and reconciliation. So. It's about connecting the dots. If you're doing as much testing and learning about your users and what works and what doesn't and you're iterating really quickly, you will quickly amass a ton of information about your users and a ton of learning. So it's on the full team, especially the design team, to connect those dots and to figure out why this learning that seems to contradict this other learning, how they all fit into the same picture. Uh, that's a lot. So. Uh, we wanted to give you a quick example of how we've actually worked that stuff into real product. Uh, so health insurance marketplace, probably everybody's favorite topic. Uh, first thing, so Jen came to the team, Jen's our CEO, uh, and she said, okay guys, we got three months, we need to build a nationwide marketplace, uh, it needs to have more than just the usual suspect features, and it needs to have real decision support since that's what we pride ourselves on. Uh, people really need help figuring this stuff out. Um, that was definitely a stressful <laughs> moment, uh, but the team pulled together uh, and basically the leads all partnered to do these things, right? So first, discover the problem. Uh, we put a bunch of users in front of different competitors. One of the first things we found was everybody asks a bunch of questions. Everybody asks about your prescriptions, your doctors, et cetera. You get to the end, the people make a recommendation. Maybe they'll even explain that recommendation, some of the better uh, experiences. And then people inevitably would say, now show me everything else. Uh, so regardless of the explained recommendation, everybody wanted to know the full list and then immediately went into analysis paralysis. So black box recommendations weren't going to work. We needed to get them to trust the output. Uh, and that came from that really uh, strong discovery track. Uh, value and usability. Uh, so rapid prototyping, joint synthesis, some really hideous prototypes that I can say because I made them, the ones Natalie worked on were much better looking, uh, to get answers really quickly. Uh, and what we figured out was, if you can make a one-to-one -one correlation between what somebody wants and what they think that they need in their health insurance to the output, they'll trust it because they feel that they built it. Feasibility, right? Engineering's working on this behind the scenes, how to integrate uh, prescriptions, doctors, plan data from across the country, uh, over 100 uh, health insurers. Uh, and here's a couple screenshots that are really blasted out on these monitors. Pretend there's some uh, borders on these things. Uh, so one of the things was, uh, suggesting generics when you uh, put in your prescriptions. So help people save a little bit of money, we could automatically include those. Uh, then this idea of trade-offs, right? You know, Jen and Fran were actually talking to people on the phones, trying to help them understand what they needed to buy. And one of the things that kept coming up time and time again was this idea of trade-offs. You can't have everything. Uh, both of them are pretty frank people. <laughs> uh, and so they would say, you know, you can't necessarily have this tiny, tiny deductible and this tiny, tiny premium and all of this coverage, it's the American health system. So we worked that into the product and it actually led to more people trusting the output. Uh, here's one of the policy cards, again, pretend you can see some borders. Uh, it tells you, based on those priorities, where this plan stacks up. So it has that low deductible that you wanted, low in quotes, because that's 2,350 uh, bucks. Network and doctors, who's included, who's not, and prescriptions. So everything played back into the things that you said you needed. So when you looked at the output, you actually, uh, you understood it and uh, trusted it. So uh, that was a series of empowered team leads trying to figure out through a pretty strong discovery track, uh, what were the right things we needed to value as we launched this product? Uh, and that's what keeps us design driven. Uh, oh, and uh, we won a, uh, we were a finalist for Fast Company Magazine Innovation by Design Award for that health flow, specifically for that kind of framing around trade-offs, which was cool. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, guys. Oh, we're hiring, of course. <laughs>
Uh, so email us if uh, any of that was interesting to you. Uh, and we'll open it up to questions. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, amazing close of the night. And one of the most interesting insights you talked about was AB, uh, putting your competitors' products in front of an audience to test. I'd love if you could, you could share a little bit more about that, because I actually have not heard that idea before. Yeah, pretty eye-opening, and you, and you can do it through, uh, you know, unmoderated platforms like usertesting.com, or you can bring these folks into uh, the office, which is what we did at the time. Um, and it allows you to kind of be that uh, invisible research team that you always want to be and just watch them with absolutely no bias using these things. And to be fair, you know, there were a lot of decent experiences out there, so we wanted to learn about what was working for people, how did they understand them, and how were these services helping, and also where were they falling short. Uh, and it was really, really productive. It's awesome. And a uh, second question before we open up to one or two others. Um, you are selling a very complicated product that uh, people need to trust before they make a purchasing decision. What have you learned about balancing providing you know, too, uh, too much information versus too little information, too much detail, not enough detail? Any, any of you on how to find that balance? Yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult one, uh, and as ex-consultants, we like to put things on a two-by-two. Two. Uh, and so um, it basically comes down to where you are in the, in the shopping journey, and so uh, you've got people who really are starting at the beginning, or they're right at the end and they want to purchase. And then on the other side of the axis, you've got people who are very detail-orientated, and people who are not, people who don't want the detail. Me, detailed-orientated, JT, not, right? And that's kind of the arguments that we'll get into on a regular basis, on a product and design basis. Um, and so it's really making sure that you're surfacing the right information when they need, because people don't want a black box experience, but not overwhelming them on the experience. Uh, and then figuring out, you know, some solutions you can solve digitally, and it's not something that you have to solve all digitally, and that the human aspects to things are also important. And so I think in the fintech world, there's been a big emphasis on Rogo and everything like that. Um, but the human is still really important in this because these are important decisions, and people want to feel validated. And that's where a lot of the trust comes from. And so we build technology around that. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, all right, one question. Oops, sorry. I've got a different uh, kind of question. Uh, you know, everything happens after you get sick or hurt or something like that. But just something I'm interested in is, you know, being proactive in your own health care. And I was wondering in what you're looking at, if there's been some kind of an idea of maybe rewarding people because they didn't get sick and also providing means of how they can be proactive in their health care. So there's a couple of things. So the biggest business line that we sell is actually life insurance. Uh, and so there's actually a couple of insurance companies out there that are innovating in this space. Uh, Hancock is one of them. Uh, and they'll actually reward you uh, for living a healthier lifestyle. So uh, they use Fitbits, Apple Watches, and a company called Vitality to actually have membership rewards uh, that are incenting you to, to leave, a good be, you know, leave a good life. And that'll actually impact your premium. And they'll actually give you uh, rewards for that as well. So there are a couple of companies uh, uh, looking at it. Uh, Oscar was doing similar things in terms of some of the stuff that they were looking to reward consumers on. For us, I think the biggest challenge, because we're, you know, we're a distributor, we're getting people to actually make these decisions, uh, is getting past the inertia and actually trying to find ways to incent them to make smart decisions that affect your future self. Uh, and that's really difficult. That's a problem that we're going to actually tackle next year. We're getting more into the financial advice piece. Uh, and so if people are interested in tackling that, uh, come and chat to us. Uh, I think JT mentioned we're hiring. Yeah, so I believe the question was, how can you get designers involved in the data side? But you were also mentioning the research side. So not just the quantitative, but also the qualitative methodology and outcomes. Uh, 
So uh, one of the things on the quant side is make the quant really accessible. So make sure that it's easy to dive in and figure out anything behaviorally about, behaviorally about an interface, the business metrics about a particular flow or case. Uh, make that easy to get or provide it regularly. Um, designers by nature typically want to act on that stuff. So you're probably, you're not going to have a lot of problem there. It's more make sure they can get to it. And then on the qualitative side, uh, you know, actually typically designers or researchers are the ones that have the monopoly on user empathy. It's not normally the other way around. So to get uh, your designers involved more, I think they'll probably have that natural inclination. And one thing that we've found that works across teams, not just for designers or engineers, is to make sure you've got those people in the room during these research sessions. Kick it off by scheduling them yourself, getting the people in the room, making sure you're trying to um, get information on the right things, and then that will snowball into designers wanting to take that information and run with it. Um, the other thing that works is actually just putting them in charge of that. So putting them in charge of the qualitative research methodology. How do we want to do this? Um, how will we handle scheduling, acquiring the users, screening the users, and um, synthesizing the data? All right, gentlemen. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to call it. But I got to say, that was one of the most information-dense presentations we've ever hosted at Design Driven. Thank you very much. That was terrific. Thank you. Yeah.